Well, good morning, everybody. What do you think of the cricks so far? It's pretty good, isn't it? Huh? Um, we're very pleased to be in here and very pleased indeed to welcome you all here for this conference. Um, during the day, whilst you're hearing all these interesting talks that you just heard a little bit about, I want you to remember above you are 1,200 biomedical research scientists and 300 support staff. And that is the CRIC, and I wanted to spend my 10 minutes just saying something about the CRIC as a biomedical research institute. It's uh, opened only in 2017, so we've only been around here for two years. Our mission is simple. It's to understand the fundamental biology underlying health and disease. And this, of course, in turn, will help improve treatment, diagnosis, and prevention of human disease. We are supported by the three major biomedical research funders in the UK. The Cancer Research UK and the MRC are the uh, major funders, the Wellcome Trust a minor funder, and three major universities, the three great universities of London, Imperial College, University College, and King's College. Researchers here are really working on how does life work? How does life work? Ranging from the molecules and cells through to whole organisms, we work on many, many problems that then lead to novel ways of thinking about human disease and also commercial developments. We focus on discovery research, and our sort of phrase that we use to describe ourselves is a discovery research um, institute very open to translation, translation to both medical and societal um, benefits because it's discovery research which is going to create the future. And you're going to hear more about that, of course, um, during um, your conference. Many new medical treatments begin with the unexpected. Look at CRISPR-Cas. You know, you can barely open a newspaper um, without reading something about CRISPR-Cas. I first heard about it when I was reading an obscure paper 10 years ago on Bacterial immune systems, how bacteria fight bacteriophage. Who thought that could lead to a revolution of gene editing in ability to modify human genes in an extremely targeted fashion? Nobody thought that, but that's what happened. And that happened because of open discovery um, research. Two examples from here. One from my own lab, uh, the cell cycle, in yeast. Who's interested in yeast? Nobody's interested in yeast. I was interested in yeast <laughs> and how yeast cells control their division. That led to understanding how human cells um, control division. That has led, in turn, to new treatments in cancer already in the clinic. My colleague here, um, Julian Downwood, he discovered uh, uh, genes, in fact, in one of the founding institutes. I was there at the time, then called the Imperial Cancer Research Fund. <laughs> Um, that as to how they controlled cell growth. And that, in turn, has led to both commercial ventures and real advances in clinical treatments. Now, I said, we're a discovery research institute, very open to translation. And we achieve that by having a very active translational team and entrepreneurs in, um, uh, in, in residence who work with our scientists to maximise that transition. More than two-thirds of our research groups are working with that team, trying to take their science forward into the development of useful applications, developing spin-outs, new companies. Um, two that I mentioned already that have been developed in the last two years, Achilles Ther Therapeutics, a, a lab run by Charlie Swanson, aiming at identifying the unique structures in patients' cancer cells and then directing that patient's own immune system to target and kill the cancer. Second company, Gamma Delta Therapeutics, another spin-out, um, this time from our immunosurveillance lab run by Adrian Hayday, who uh, co-discovered um, a new type of immune cell which can destroy um, disease cells even in um, solid tumour tissues, which of course is very, very difficult. So we are truly open um, to um, translation. Indeed, over the course of this event, you're going to hear from a range of speakers, including one of our scientists, Paolo 
Bonfanti about the future of healthcare and the applications of new technology. Now, I'm just going to finish with a few statistics about the Institute, because I think they are impressive, they are interesting, and I'd just like to share them with you. Although we've only been open for two years, we already have, frankly, I'm not sure we deserve it, but we already have a worldwide reputation. Um, we have around 90 research groups, and we are focusing on early career junior group leaders, but we also have senior group leaders like me with white hair who look after the nursery, as some people call, um, call it. Our object, however, is to recruit junior group leaders from around the world to take a risk with those at the very early stage of their career, train them, develop them, help them, mentor them, and then after 10 to 12 years here, we help them find a position somewhere else. In other words, we don't hang on to our best people. We train them and then help them go somewhere else as a pipeline for the rest of the UK's biomedical research endeavour. That's a very novel system. You go to a university, they're great people, they hang on like grim death. We train them, <laughs> and then we get rid of them to support the rest of the endeavour. And that means we have to be very good at choosing high-quality junior researchers. And for every search, we've been doing searches for two years, we've hired about 15 people so far, and for every open search, we are getting 300 to 400 applicants from around the world. I've never worked in an institution with anything like that amount of interest, 300 to 400. And we're building up a fantastic group of young faculty, many of whom will um, support directly the UK biomedical research endeavour, and because some of them will go elsewhere, over time, we will build up a network across the world. And so this will become a hub for the rest of the world. They will be supported by our senior group leaders, who have a job not only to do high-quality research, but also to support our junior group leaders. About half of our senior group leaders are FRSs, Fellows of the Royal Society. It's a very, very high proportion. Three of our faculty and our Meritai faculty have the Nobel Prize. Three in this place. It's extraordinary. There's none in Oxford, for example just to put it in place. <laughs> we also attract excellent trainee scientists. Our PhD program of 35 students each year attracts 1,003 applicants from all over the world. That's 30 to 40 to 1 applicants for every PhD student. I mean, I'm overwhelmed by the interest in this institution. And it is based on... Um, this superb intellectual strength that we're attracting, from the earliest trans trainee to the, the most accomplished um, senior scientist, combined with a highly supportive research culture and the highest standards, that it is from this that the discoveries of the future will come. So do enjoy your conference. It's an exciting time for biomedicine, and this widening uh, event will introduce you to much work at the forefront of biomedicine. Always remember what's going on above your head. I apologise I'm not with you. I have to go on to something else straight away. But have a fantastic time, and thanks for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you.